the latest ITV news in the Time Tees region with Ian Payne and Amy Lee. Hello, good evening. Welcome to ITV News Time Tees. Tonight's headlines. The murder trial of toddler Charlie Roberts is told he suffered injuries consistent with an abusive head trauma. Residents say they are sick of off-road and quad bikes tearing around their Teesside neighbourhood. It's ridiculous. They're all balaclavered up. So you can't see, you can't recognise who they are. And then before you know it, they're through the streets and off the way. And Middlesbrough are hoping for a home win and even more goals as they welcome Blackburn Rovers to the Riverside tonight. I think there's a natural confidence. Of course there is. With coming, winning football matches and, and, and scoring goals, there's a natural confidence. With how you manage that confidence, how you use that confidence, it's a crucial part, you know. First tonight, an expert witness has told the murder trial of toddler Charlie Roberts that he had suffered a non-accidental trauma. A uh, warning that you may find the evidence heard at Teesside Crown Court today distressing. The jury was told that Charlie, who was 22 months old, had an injury that caused significant bleeding in his eyes. His mother's partner, Christopher Stockton, denies murdering the toddler and child abuse. Charlie's mother, Paula Roberts, denies neglect. Our correspondent, Greg Steel has the latest from court. Now, in its third week, the jury and the trial surrounding the death of little Charlie Roberts having to listen today to more detailed and distressing evidence about the injuries found to the 22-month-old after he died in hospital last January. Emergency services had been called to his home in Frostley Drive in Darlington, after he suffered from what the prosecution have described as a catastrophic head injury. This morning, an ophthalmic expert from Alderhay Children's Hospital on Merseyside told the jury both the child's eyes had a significant number of bleeding injuries and that the damage to his left eye was so severe his retina had split at the back of the socket. Dr Joe McPartland's assessment to the court was that these injuries were very characteristic of abusive head trauma. Pressed further about what could have been the cause of those extensive eye injuries, she said it was consistent with being shaken forward or backward with rapid acceleration and deceleration, she agreed. Possibly, she added, in coordination with being struck against a soft object like a sofa. She dismissed suggestions that those eye injuries could have been caused as a result of choking. The court's already been told 38-year-old Christopher Stockton, the partner of Charlie's mother, who was in sole care of the toddler at the time, had told paramedics he thought he'd choked on a biscuit. He denies the child's murder, along with a charge of child neglect. Charlie's mother, 41-year-old Paula Roberts, seen here with her hood up, denies a charge of child neglect in relation to injuries Charlie allegedly suffered prior to his death. The hearing at Teesside Crown Court is continuing. Greg Eastfield, ITV News. Residents of One Road on Teesside say they've started patrolling the streets at night to try to stop off-road and quad bikes being driven around dangerously. People who live in the area of Yarm Road in Stockton say it's happening more frequently and that something needs to change. Well, last week, the government announced stronger powers for police and councils to try to tackle the problem, as Jenny Henry reports. This is what's going on as the dark nights draw in in Stockton. Quad bikes, as well as off-road bikes and e-bikes, have been reportedly terrorising this area. We see all the time that men rather ride on the road or anything else, they're on the footpath, and like I said, you can't see them. So as soon as you come out your front drive, you know, we've had me and Mr. Kennison on many occasions and it's just getting to the point where it's, it's ridiculous. They're all balaclavered up, so you can't see, you can't recognise who they are. And then before you know it, they're through the streets and off the way. Tarek is part of the local residents' association. They've set up nighttime patrols to try and deter this kind of behaviour. 
we do try to flag these guys down. We do say to them, hey, calm down, because obviously when we look at, look around and there's children walking about, or you've got older people probably just going to the local shop. I mean, it's like unlicensed people who are just driving up and down with very high speed without any due care. The way I look at it, I think we've just been laughed at and uh, nothing has really been done. It's quite intimidating, you know, the, the, the number of off-road bikes and quad bikes that actually go up and down these streets, and we've seen an increase in that. Shaquille is a local councillor who says this is a problem that's only getting worse. It was a local thing, but now we've seen that it's spreading throughout the borough, and it's becoming the kind of norm thing. So you could be walking down the street and see one of these quad bikes. If we ignore it, it will get worse. It probably will become, you know, a lawless society. Yarm Road here is one of the busiest routes into Stockton. It stretches all the way from Eagles Cliff and Yarm up into the town centre. And because of how busy it is, it makes this behaviour extremely dangerous. And that concern is something that's been raised by politicians in Parliament today. Antisocial behaviour involving modified and off-road bikes is a menace. Can the Prime Minister outline how he will back the police to tackle the misery caused by intimidating and downright dangerous antisocial behaviour on bikes? Yeah. Well, th I thank you for raising this because um, antisocial behaviour affects so many people. Sometimes it's described to me as low level. It isn't in the impact it has, particularly when it comes to off-road bikes. And that's why we're implementing tough new respect orders, which will give powers to the police, including powers to seize off-road bikes, but crucially uh, adds a power of arrest for breach of the orders. These respect orders will be piloted before being rolled out nationally. The police say they already seize bikes on a daily basis and that tackling the problem is a priority. But for the residents of Yarn Road, they say they'll continue to step out each night to keep their streets safe. Jenny Henry, ITV News. Taking a look now at some more of the day's news. And the government is reviewing rules on electric vehicles after Nissan warned that they risk the viability of thousands of jobs. The manufacturer employs more than 6,000 people on Wearside. Under current rules, at least 22% of all new cars sold in the UK must be zero emission. Nissan last week called for urgent action over fines that are handed to companies struggling to meet the target because of low customer demand. This transition must be done in partnership between government, industry and, of course, consumers. And that is why my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, and I, are listening closely to the concerns of the automotive industry and the wider sector about the transition to electric vehicles and the Conservative Party's zero emission vehicle mandate. Middlesbrough Council have announced plans to save £7 million as part of next year's budget. It could see some home to school transport that the council pays for cut, as well as an increase in car parking costs and a rise in council tax. The council say it would allow them to continue to improve social care, which accounts for 79% of their budget. Street cleaning and grass cutting will see investment for the first time in a decade. The plans will go to public consultation ahead of a final decision next February. Your GITV News Time Tees still to come on tonight's programme. We are at the Riverside as the Borough look to continue their good run of form against Blackburn Rovers tonight. And temperatures fell away to around minus five last night. Another frosty night to come with a few freezing fog patches for parts of the region. I'll have all the weather details in just a few minutes. Now, Darlington's MP, Lola McAvoy, has described online safety for children as a crisis during a debate at Westminster. It follows concerns from parents in her constituency over what their children are exposed to on the internet or social media. Staff and pupils of Beaumont Hill Academy have been working alongside their MP to highlight the issue. And they say it's vital that people understand the risks online. Emily Reader reports. The online world can be dangerous to dive into. But apps and platforms play a huge role in the lives of many of our children. Here at Beaumont Academy, staff have strict controls on what can be accessed. 
In schools, we have a lot of measures in place, filtering and monitoring is a big responsibility placed on schools now. So when they're online in our school buildings, they're exceptionally safe. However, that doesn't always extend to when they leave the school building and go into the community. This issue is one of the most defining of our time. Lola McAvoy has been working with schools and parents in her constituency to try and improve online safety. She'd been horrified at some of the things young people have been exposed to whilst using apps. The children in my town, and I'm sure all of you know this, have told me that current age verification requirements are easily passed through and that content on these sites is really, is deeply disturbing and sent to them without them asking for it. So what that actually means is that the sites themselves are hosting content that is deeply disturbing for children and that the age verification isn't fit for purpose. So we need to talk in the round either about stopping those sites posting that content, which is very, very difficult, or changing the age verification process. New legislation, the Online Safety Act, sets out to minimise risks, placing new legal responsibilities on online providers to try and keep young people safe. But research by regulator Ofcom shows around 70% of parents are worried about their children being bullied online. The government is committed to keeping children safe online and it is crucial that we continue to have these conversations about how best to achieve this goal. Teachers at Beaumont Academy want to empower young people to speak out about online safety. If it's, nothing's in place yet, our, our, our kids and our, our next generation will get severely get mental health and all these problems will get affected. There's issues all over the internet, so it's only natural that people, no matter how safe you can be, will come across issues that are going to be talked about online. We should all be aware of any people that are out here uh, in the open world and we should all be safe. Keeping children safe online is more complex than ever, but including them in the fight against dangerous content is certainly working for the young people here. Emily Reader, ITV News. Well, protecting children and offering them support is the theme of our next story as well, because people in our region are being urged to consider giving up their time to volunteer to support young people who may be feeling overwhelmed, isolated or increasingly anxious. Childline, which has been running since 1986, says that it takes a call every 45 seconds from a child asking for help or advice. With the number of young people reaching out as high as ever, the NSPCC is seeking more volunteers to ensure that every child can be helped as quickly as possible. Chris Conway reports. I have autism. I hate going to school. I feel like everyone looks tired and annoyed after helping me. I just want to be normal. I followed your advice and shared with one of my teachers how overwhelmed I feel about my exams and the situation at home. You gave me the confidence to seek help. Voiced by actors, these calls examples of the type of issues young people are contacting Childline about. Gail works for the NSPCC across the North East and says those volunteering at Childline really help the children that call. It takes a lot for a young person to admit that something's wrong, that something's upsetting them, and actually being able to be there for them when perhaps no one else they feel like they can talk to is there. I mean, that's so, you're making such a difference. Last year, Childline delivered almost 200,000 counselling sessions with children and young people. The top three concerns of callers were mental health, suicidal thoughts and family relationships. In more than 17,000 counselling sessions, Childline was the first place the young person had spoken about their problem. Those figures illustrate why the services on offer at Childline centres like this one remain vital and why the NSPCC, the charity that delivers the Childline service, continues to appeal for more volunteers. At Childline we want to reach every child or young person first time every time and at the moment we're not able to do that. The more people we have come and volunteer for us, the more chance we've got of reaching every single child or young person. Despite Childline operating for decades, one child psychologist believes the modern pressures created by technology means the service remains vital. There is um, definitely, with the children and young people that I am working with, there's a thread coming through where they just do not feel that there is space made for them. 
can hear things have been really difficult for you lately. Do you mind telling me more about how things have been going? Emmons says volunteers like herself will always take the time to listen. These young people, they don't feel hurt. You know, at schools or with their families, they do need a safe space where they can open up about their feelings, which they're not getting anywhere else. For anyone wishing to volunteer, full training is provided. The NSPCC say they'll be joining a team whose help for children is just a call away. Chris Conway, ITV News. You can take your time, there's no rush. Next tonight, adopted children are likely to be allowed much closer contact with their birth families in the future following a new report. It would mean more face-to-face -face meetings between children and their birth parents. But currently, the level of contact is authorised by judges in family courts. It's usually just by letter in tightly controlled circumstances. One charity that campaigns on behalf of birth parents has welcomed the move as long overdue. Others, though, say there needs to be adequate support for those involved, which currently isn't available everywhere. Kevin Ashford reports. Around 3,000 children are adopted in England every year. Judges in family courts establish the level of contact that's allowed between the child and birth parents. It's usually through letters that are closely controlled in content and sent via an intermediary. It's a system known as letterboxing. However, a new report says that's outdated and there should be more face-to-face -face contact where it's safe. Fegan Boyens, who lives in New York, was adopted but now has direct contact with her birth family. I am grateful for the letterbox contact I had and it's also a nice souvenir as such to have all those letters to look back at and sort of have as a memory. I just think it doesn't hold the same naturality as letterbox, not many people these days write letters or even emails to family and friends and I think it just misses out sometimes those smaller little elements that actually you can't ever capture in letters, you know, you can't capture memories, you can't remember, you know, jokes someone said, you know, they're very formal in that sense. This is my daughter blowing out her candles with her brother there, a moment we never thought we were going to get to see. Angela Fraser Wicks recently met her eldest son for the first time in 20 years. He and his younger brother were adopted when Angela was in an abusive relationship and struggling with addiction and mental health problems. Angela has since recovered as a new relationship and a daughter and campaigns for the rights of birth parents in adoption. She says each case is different. Nobody is saying that there aren't situations where contact shouldn't be happening because there are risks and there are a danger and I think that if we come from this from a point of what is best for this child and what is safe for this child and then build the support around that to make sure it happens, then we can, we can mitigate any risk and avoid any potential harm. A survey by the charity Adoption UK found that 70% of prospective adopters believe that direct contact for adopted children with their birth families should be standard practice as long as it was deemed safe. And 69% of adopted adults who didn't have childhood direct contact regretted not having the opportunity. However, the charity says specialist support for all involved is vital. So families can often be left sort of managing the risk of contact all by themselves. And that means that young people might um, arrange a, a meeting or a, arrange a, a contact and then not have um, somebody turn up. And that can be really devastating for that young person. And there's no one there to pick up the pieces. So it's really, really important that we get these sort of specialist contact workers in place. The government told ITV it's vital that the child's best interests are protected and remain at the heart of the adoption process. All eyes will now be on how those involved in adoption cases are treated in family courts, as judges there interpret the report's recommendations. Kevin Ashford, ITV News. We'll have the sport for you in just a moment. Simon's out on the road again this evening. And the ITV Evening News continues after us at 6.30 with Mary Nightingale. Coming up on the ITV Evening News, the former boss of the hospital where Lucy Letby worked faces questions over decisions and delays. A special investigation into the dangers of some weight loss injections. We speak to pop legend Robbie Williams about his new film and career highs and lows. Do join me for those stories and more at 6.30.
Zero Accounting Software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. So on to sport and this week's tour of North East football continues. Now Simon was at Newcastle on Monday, he was at Sunderland last night and now Simon is at Middlesbrough's Riverside Stadium. Simon. Yes and hopefully we might see a home win or at least a North East team scoring a goal because the last couple of nights haven't gone too well have they? But when it comes to goal scoring we might have come to the right place because Middlesbrough can't stop scoring goals at the moment. They scored four goals away at QPR on November the 5th, then five goals at home to Luton the following Saturday, and they came back after the international break with six goals at Oxford last weekend. So ahead of tonight's game against Blackburn Rovers, who can't be looking forward to this, what's changed for Michael Carrick's team? It's difficult to say what's changed, you know, there's not many runs where you go on that we've had where so many goals go in. Um, it's a little bit unique, really, if, if we're totally honest. It's a little bit probably more than we'd expect, but we, we felt for a large part of the season, you know, that that, that, that has been coming and we've been improving and we've been getting there and it's not getting away from the fact that as a team we're, we're playing some really good football. So Middlesbrough are hot at the moment, Simon. You look freezing, by the way, but they are hot <laughs> and they've found top form. Can they sustain this and how far can it take them? Well, Michael Carrick, I think, is entitled to say, I told you so, because he has been saying at every press conference that this was coming. They were playing well, even during their uncertain start to the season, and that the goals and the wins would come. He's been proved right. They have found that top gear. They're not going to score five every game, but they've got confidence now. I think the crucial thing is when you look at the table, they haven't been left behind. They haven't been cut adrift from anything, so anything is still possible. And talking of the championship table, Simon, it also shows that Sunderland have dropped out of the automatic promotion places. Yes, another draw. Yeah, that's five draws in a row, but on the other hand, it's ten unbeaten, so it's kind of hard to know what to say about the Black Cats at the moment. The one thing we can say without much argument is that last night's goalless draw against West Brom was not a classic. Believe me. Um, Sunderland dominated possession, but they couldn't do much with it. And both teams stuck to their respective game plan admirably. So I suppose tactically it was interesting enough, it just wasn't much fun. Wilson Isidore had a goal ruled out for offside and it probably was offside. Apart from that, it was just bits and bobs really and not a great deal of excitement. So on the one hand, the Black Cats are currently unbeatable, but on the other hand, they can't beat anybody. They can't win at the moment. I'm a little bit disappointed and frustrated, uh, for sure. It was the, um, the main feeling in the dressing room at the end of the, um, of the game. We had probably three or four chances to score, and we didn't. And probably, because we are still young, um, we didn't manage so well the frustration we can have in this kind of situation. There's highlights of all the midweek EFL action if you stay up late. ITV4 at 5 past midnight is the time and place to be. Well, in the National League last night, we had the good, the bad and the ugly. The good was at Hartlepool, where the home team beat Files 2-0, and Pools are just a couple of points outside the playoff places. The bad was York City. The Minster men are off the top of the table after a 3-0 defeat at Altrincham. And the ugly was provided by Gateshead, and it was ugly, but it was also a bit unfortunate. Robbie Tinkler's own goal gifted Rochdale victory at the International Stadium. Rochdale also had a man sent off. Gateshead dropped to fifth in the table. Right, after a nightmare in Newcastle and the most goalless of goalless draws at Sunderland, I am hoping that Borough can warm me up with a bit of excitement and good news here tonight. Someone get Simon a hot chocolate. I'm an exciting game for him as well. Uh, now, whether you're a bit of an early bird who's already put up your Christmas decorations, I've seen a few already in the windows going round, or perhaps you prefer to wait until nearer the day, you will know the difficulties either way of dressing your Christmas tree. Those lights getting tangled, you can't quite reach the top. Well, imagine if your tree was tall, really tall. We're talking <laughs> twice the height of the Angel of the North. Yeah, that's tall. The tallest living Christmas tree in the country has been decorated, though, in Northumberland, and the lights switched on. Julia Bartram has been there for us to watch the spectacle. I bet that was magical, Julia. 
Yep, it is looking very Christmassy here at Cragside. You can see the house a bit behind me, hopefully lit up. And here, you can probably only see the bottom of it because it's huge. The giant redwood, 42 metres of the UK's tallest living Christmas tree with 2,000 lights. And the man who had the whopping task of doing that is Steve. How on earth did you get those lights on there? A uh, huge team effort, so it definitely wasn't just me. Um, but yeah, it's a huge team effort. There's, we've got uh, many hours, well, 12 hours of uh, work much up to go into it. A uh, huge 52 metre cherry pick out along the way to help get the lights to the top. But yeah, definitely a huge, huge team effort here at Cragside. How long did it take and how many people were working on that? Uh, we had about five people working on it at one time, you know, up to about 12 hours of, of time to go on over there. Yeah. A bit longer than it takes me to do my Christmas tree. Yeah, it's a long time, yeah. <laughs> and Clara, you're the curator here. Why did you think this was an appropriate thing for Cragside? Well, Cragside's always been a place of innovation, and we were the first place in the world to be lit with hydroelectricity. So we thought that we needed to do something really spectacular to celebrate that legacy. So with lighting uh, the UK's largest living Christmas tree, we thought that that would be something that our founder, Armstrong, would be really proud of. And the lights have just been switched on by George Clark, architect. You've seen some amazing constructions in your time. Not that what many do you think of trees like this, though. I mean, this is off the scale. Um, it's an honour and a privilege for me to do this today. I had the easy job. These guys have been working so hard. I just turned the switch on. I have to say it's a beautiful switch. It was engineered just for today, which I feel really proud to have done that. But for this to be the UK's largest living Christmas tree, I think the whole of the region should be really proud. Mm -hmm. And this is quite an inspirational place, isn't it? I love it. I came here when I was a young architecture student and I've been back hundreds of times since. It's genuinely my favourite house in the world. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful spot and a beautiful location and what a building as well. And we've now got a gorgeous tree. Thank you very much all. Also with us are a team from Rothbury First School. You've just seen the light switched on. What do you think of the tree? Uh, it's actually got a lot of lights on. Have you decorated your tree yet? Uh, no, we haven't put it up yet. Anybody here decorated their tree yet? No, I haven't. We're putting it up on Sunday now. Oh, nearly. And is it going to be as hard to put the lights on this, your tree as it is on this one? No. <laughs> what do you put on the top of your tree? Um, an angel. An angel. I think it's a bit easy to reach the top of your tree, perhaps, than this one. Well, this tree is switched on. The lights are now on till Christmas, and it's open to the public to come and visit from Saturday. Oh, Julia, thank you so much indeed. Magical at Rothbury with a special team of helpers there as well. Amazing. Cragside really is one of our region's amazing spaces. Yeah. Time for the weather now. Here's Joe. Today's forecast, seafood and sugar cube towns. To be sponsors, ITV, Time Tees Weather. Thank you, very good evening to you. It was cold last night, we saw a few freezing fog patches this morning, and it'll be very similar tonight. Mostly a drier day to come tomorrow, with winds picking up later on. And by the weekend, milder air will be pushing in across the whole of the UK. You can see that ingress is something slightly less cold. As we approach the end of the week, it's not without its outbreaks of rain, but there's no real problems weather-wise as we head through the next few days. Back to you tonight, the odd shower for North Sea coast, and it's cold, so cater for a few icy stretches there. Inland, the odd freezing fog patch for the Cheviots, the Pennines, and dry conditions, with a hard frost to come again, minus three or minus four, our overnight low before tomorrow morning. And just be aware if there's a few freezing fog patches first thing, visibility could be a bit tricky to start the day. The sun will be up at 8 o'clock. It'll set tomorrow afternoon at 3.46. For the northeast tomorrow, a chilly start to the day, but generally dry. Winds are very light at first. We've got those freezing fog patches initially, which will lift, revealing brighter skies through the morning. But cloud tends to build a little into the afternoon. It should just about stay dry, though. Pretty chilly, 3 or 4 Celsius, maybe a touch higher at best. Winds picking up a touch by the end of the day, particularly up on higher ground in the west. As we go into tomorrow night, there'll be a few fog patches once more. And to end this week, quite cloudy conditions. It's rather dull, but you can see a bit of a jump up in temperatures by the time we get to the weekend, 12 or 13 Celsius. No real danger of any overnight frost. It does look unsettled and breezy, though, through Sunday. Enjoy your evening. I'll see you soon. Two sponsors, ITV, Time Tees Weather.
Thank you, Joe. In just a moment then, the national news. Let's leave you with pictures from Crag's side, those wonderful sights this evening. Armstrong's house, of course, the birthplace, hydroelectricity. Not for the first time, they have declared, let there be light. Good night.